Uh, thanks for taking times out of your busy schedules to be here uh, with ACSA with me today to talk about culturally responsive teaching. Um, the, the purpose of this particular webinar or lecture is really for us to think about um, ways in which we can create an equitable architectural education. And I'd like to note that um, culturally responsive teaching or culturally relevant pedagogy is just one of many strategies uh, that can set us up for a more equitable framework. Uh, so for those who don't know me, I'm Kendall Nicholson. I'm ACSA's Director of Research and Information. Uh, my background is in architecture, real estate, and education. Um, and so I'm glad to be here to talk specifically about um, one of those strategies, like I mentioned, which is culturally responsive teaching. I'd like to start, if I may, with a moment of silence and observation of racial inequities, um, and I'll say racial inequities writ large. Thank you for that. Um, one of the things that I, I typically start presentations with a general acknowledgement of, um, of the nation's history, race and racism, genocide, slavery, uh, white only immigration, et cetera. Um, what I'm talking about today is not, um, it's not explicitly about race, but I, um, I wanted to, to try to take a moment to forefront our collective socio-political awareness um, in light of watching George Floyd's uh, trial um, over the past few days. And so I, I, I appreciate you all giving me the space and, and time to do that. So as I stated, this talk is largely about culturally re relevant pedagogy um, or culturally responsive uh, teaching. Uh, and I'm going to talk about strategies that will create a more equitable architectural education by way of acknowledging where students, um, a student's cultural home base, so to speak. So uh, answering the question, what is equity? Uh, to put it simply, equity is the reallocation of resources in a way that recognizes history and systems. So as I said, the hope here is to provide strategies that help us recognize culture as an essential part of student learning and, and as such reallocate resources um, in a way that recognizes not only that history, but the, not only that culture, excuse me, but the history and systems um, of our nation. And so the goal um, in this is that the goal in equity is that reallocation piece, right? Um, that we're going to take resources that would typically be given to a privileged class. Um, in this, we could say the professoriate, right? Like the, the professor and reallocate it to a group that um, has less privilege uh, and is, is thought of as having less expertise. Um, which would be the student in this case, and in particular, um, BIPOC students. So to further uh, help explain this, I'm sharing this table uh, that has a long list of identity categories down the middle. Um, you'll see on the left, the privileged groups identified. And on the right, you'll see marginalized groups identified. Um, today, we're going to talk specifically about culture, but I want to recognize that each of these identity categories plays a role in the way in which we are, the way in which our culture is manifested, right? Um, and so it's crucial to understand the, the intersectionality that exists between all of these identity classifications or categories. Um, because it directly corresponds to the way in which we view the world, which is um, extraordinarily important. Um, and really modifying one of these identity categories um, 
makes it harder for, I'm, I'm thinking in, uh, specifically about students and, and faculty, modifying one of these um, identity categories to be marginalized makes it harder to send and receive messages, um, whether they be messages in the classroom, whether they be uh, uh, body language and, and other messages, because cultural norms uh, are different. And so um, I'll use myself as an example. If I look at the privileged group column, um, I meet a lot of the, the privileged groups um, just by nature of gender and being able-bodied, being uh, in my 30s and middle class. Um, and so the the main um, identity that that transforms my worldview is that of race, right? I don't identify as white. I identify as black, and as such, my worldview has shifted. Um, a lot of my cultural norms are different than if I had the same uh, set of privileged identities on the left, with one addition being white. I hope I hope that's clear. Um, and I'll also make the note that here, they have culture paired with ethnicity, but really culture is, is much larger than that. So um, culture is generally defined by the discipline of sociology as the shared behaviors, beliefs, customs, values, and ways of knowing that guide groups of people in their daily life and are transmitted from one generation to the next. That being said, culture is extremely complex uh, and it's also fluid. As people move, grow, age, and expand their knowledge base, cu cultural beliefs and values can and do um, change. And I'll say um, particularly among students who are still developing their identity in many ways, not just their racial identity, their, you know, how, the, how they fit and how those identities intersect. Students are largely um, still figuring that out, um, you know, as, as they're in school. So um, the third point on this slide is that the, that culture is not race. Um, there are definitely some inextricable <laughs> links between the two, as I shared earlier. Um, the, my marginalized identity uh, being race completely shifts my cultural norms, um, but they're not one and the same. And so, um, so I'll use myself again as an example. Um, I identify racially as black. And so if I were your student in a classroom, um, I might also have, let's say I'm in your classroom as a student and I have a peer in the same class um, who has immigrated from Kenya, uh, a black male that has immigrated from Kenya. He would also racially um, identify as black, but culturally we come, we come from very different places, right? My ancestry is that of uh, the American slave. And as such, I have a whole different set of cultural sensitivities that my Kenyan peer may or may not uh, be aware of, may not be sensitive to, and the same could be said of him, right? He would have a whole different set of cultural norms and sensitivities around food and language, and we would really be world, worlds apart um, as far as our cultural identity is concerned. So um, I'd be curious how many of you have seen this um, iceberg model of culture, but I'll use this analogy just to further the point of um, how complex and how fluid culture is. Um, and I also apologize for the small text on this slide and depending on what size screen you're using. Um, but in 1976, 
Uh, Edward T. Hall develops that iceberg analogy of culture. Um, and he essentially said, if the culture of a society, um, he, he mimicked it after an iceberg or modeled it after an iceberg where he reasoned that there are some aspects of one's culture that are vis visible. You can see food, language, flags, festivals, fashion, um, art, and performance, dance, literature, which would be above the water. Um, but there is actually a larger portion that are hidden beneath the surface of the water. And in culturally responsive teaching and pedagogy, we acknowledge the whole of the student's um, cultural identity. And so there are things that you would see on the surface that might dictate, as I stated in my previous example, that um, me and my Kenyan uh, classmate are different. But um, beyond that, there are a whole host of things that you wouldn't be able to see or hear um, you wouldn't notice on the surface. So here we are. Um, thank you for bearing with me through some of the background. Um, but here we are at culturally responsive teaching. And culturally responsive teaching um, builds on culturally relevant pedagogy, um, which was initially coined by Gloria Latz and Billings. Um, the term culturally relevant pedagogy um, refers to a framework that recognizes the importance of including students' cultural references and identity in all aspects of learning. The, and I'm giving a little bit of detail here, but the difference between culturally relevant pedagogy and culturally responsive teaching is that culturally re relevant pedagogy is pedagogy, uh, meaning that it's, it's theory-based. Culturally responsive teaching is the application of that. Um, and so culturally responsive teaching, like I said, builds on, on and was developed by Geneva. Um, and it really emphasizes the given students' cultural knowledge, prior experiences, um, frames of reference, and performance styles uh, to make learning encounters more relevant and more Fact. So I'm going to use culturally responsive teaching to talk about the application of culturally relevant pedagogy, um, but I'm going to use that term, uh, CRT, to really talk about all of it. Um, for me, the meat of it is really dating student voices. So when I started teaching, um, approximately 10 years ago, um, I based my practice, my teaching practice, on advice that I got from one of, um, one of the, the most well-respected teachers I knew, it was uh, to keep the three R's in balance. And so, um, as you can see there, you see rigor, relationship, and relevancy. Um, and that advice worked for me in the classroom, and it stuck with me, really the, the idea um, that good teaching was all about rigor, relationship, and relevancy. Um, the idea that the content should always be rigorous and that the goal of that rigor is actually to yield academic growth, right? Um, it's not to weed students out <laughs> or um, make it harder for students. It's really about academic growth and learning. Two, in relationships that teachers and students should have relationships that are founded on mutual trust and the development of a positive uh, racial and cultural um, identity. And then, and then three um, is the relevancy piece, which is, I think, um, which is extraordinarily important. Like, um, and that's that our practice as educators should support a student's ability to recognize, understand, and um, critique 
current and historical social inequities, right? And that's kind of what I referenced at the beginning. The social political awareness of students should grow by nature of being educated by you or us as educators. So let's take a look at the application. Pause for a minute to allow everyone who is actively engaged to read the difference between the cohesive approach and the assimilationist approach. And I'd like for everyone to engage the chat as you can. I know some of you, I'm sure, have your hands full and are doing other things, but um, if you could take a look at the list and engage the chat with the one item that is the biggest challenge for you um, in your practice as an educator. And I'll just give us one minute uh, to, to do that. Um, I'll say while you all are doing that, and actually I, I'm, I don't have the chat up, so I can't see that you all are, but um, I'll say that for me, um, it has been believing that failure is unavoidable for some. Um, and I think it's really important that we take this minute to not only be reflective, but to have some of that vulnerability, right? Um, I can get the teacher as a community organizer. If, if you read through them, um, you know, they, they're written there in tandem. Um, so teaching as an art in lieu of teaching as a technician um, or teaching as a community organizer, meaning building community in your classroom um, and engaging communities outside the classroom and opposed to encouraging achievement as a way to escape communities that your students may come from. Um, and so the, the third one is the one that is more challenging for me, believing that all students can succeed. I, I feel strong about that, but um, believing that um, failure is unavoidable for some, I, I usually struggle with the idea that like there has to be some, some motivating factor that I can't control as a teacher or as an educator. Um, and so there's, there's areas for growth for all of us, right? Um, this slide in particular is about um, what happens beyond the classroom and how we practice valuing culture um, at the school level. So the research on culturally responsive teaching notes that, um, that the school has some responsibilities too. And these responsibilities range from, as you can see here, um, hiring considerations to opportunities um, for professional development for educators to um, challenging the larger systemic issues facing higher education at large. And so um, applying culturally responsive teaching is something that should be communicated not only with the teacher in the classroom, but also among the administrators um, with the hopes that the school at large will support the initiatives and help fund and um, and bring education to not only the faculty, but the students as well. So culturally responsive teaching, I'm gonna go through uh, some of these, I'm just kind of watching my time. I'm gonna go through some of these um, tenets or characteristics. Uh, you'll notice that there are a lot of areas of overlap and that's intentional. Um, so that you are able to make the most impact, um, hopefully by just modifying some of what you do in the classroom every day. Um, and all of these strategies, so to speak, 
are built on, um, are largely built on and around the research of culturally relevant pedagogy. So the first one here um, is the communication of high expectations. And so research showed specifically, um, this is in the 80s and 90s, that when working with, um, there was a study done that showed when working with African-American students, that um, the communication of high expectations um, got much better results on, they were looking at standardized testing, but so got higher scores on standardized tests than the a group of teachers who did not communicate those high expectations. And that's why, um, as I stated earlier, the three R's are important, right? Rigor, relationship, and relevancy. And you, you can't, it's like a three-legged stool, right? You can't have one without the other. It's gonna be hard to communicate high expectations of your students if they don't actually trust and you don't have a rapport or relationship with them um, because they're not, they're not gonna be able to trust that you have their best interest at heart. Um, some contradictory examples of, I guess, not communicating high expectations would be alienating language. These are things that we say uh, almost without thinking. And I'm guilty of saying these things. I have to really think uh, intentionally about the words that I'm using. Um, one such example is how we say, well, we all know, right? The moment you say to a, a new class, uh, whether they're first years or fourth years or, or, or somewhere in between, the moment you say to them, well, we all know, and then follow that up with something that they don't know, they've started to fail, right? Um, and as I stated earlier, culture is complex and it's complicated. Um, so even if I had a group of all black students that identified racially as black, to say, well, we all know, and then state something that many of my students might know, whether it's about architecture, whether it's about the university that we're at, um, is going to alienate, is likely to alienate someone. Um, so that's something to think about. The other is um, there's been a, a longstanding history of, of architecture being so demanding that it appears to weed students out, right? That's not necessarily what we're talking about here. Um, the communication of high expectations is um, is giving students the benefit of the doubt and uh, and culturally responsive practices and or teaching is largely about um, giving students agency to be experts right you very rarely are you as an educator going to be more of an expert on a student's cultural norms and beliefs than the student themselves, right? Um, so some examples of ways to do this is to um, allow students to create individual student rubrics and um, to show them, show them the end before they get there, right? So I have here guest speakers from diverse backgrounds. Um, that shows them that if they, if they stay the course, right, with your help, uh, with the help of the university or the college, that they too can, you know, make it to the end. Um, whether that's against all odds or whether it's easy street, it's it's about communicating those high expectations. Um, and the individual student rubrics, I think I'll talk about a little bit later, but it's really the idea that you will have some basic rubric for your assignments that meet the objectives and give students space to curate that a little bit. The second characteristic is um, active teaching models. So this is the idea that um, students are playing an active role in crafting learning activities and or curriculum. And so um, some examples of this would be allowing for student autonomy, um, whether that's one of the things that used to really get me as, as a student is I'd have a, uh, a teacher in K-12 or in higher ed that would say, 
I'm going to give you a project and I'm going to leave it pretty open. And I get really excited, right? Oh, it's going to be open. That means I can sit with it and I can think about the multiple ways in which I can, you know, meet the, meet the standards. And then they would give me this long list of things that you have to do. Well, it has to be this and it has to be on this and it has to look like this or be in this realm. And then it's like, well, um, this is not really student centered is, is teacher centered. Um, and so allowing for more open ended assignments and for students to direct their learning for students to say, and this will come up again later, but for students to say, Hey, uh, let's say I'm in a materials class. Um, well, I want to figure out a specific set of materials that are, let's say popular in black and Brown communities, right? There's, there should be enough openness, openness in the assignments for them to start that trail and activate their own interests within the, the course. So I have a few examples here. This one, again, I'll apologize for the text being small. Um, this one is examples of positive or welcoming and unwelcoming uh, ways to dictate your syllabus. Um, and I know you're probably thinking like dictate my syllabus here. This is, this is one area that's often overlooked that really has the potential to communicate success and high expectations to your students. So you're not communicating that high expectation by saying, um, this will be the hardest class you ever take. You will have to, you know, put in so much work. Um, that's going to communicate that you are really not trying to make sure that they're successful. If you look at the welcoming and unwelcoming side, um, we'll take office hours, for example, it says, I the welcoming side says, I welcome you to contact me outside of class and student hours, um, and then gives the ways in which they can be contacted. Um, the unwelcoming side says, if you need to contact me outside of office hours, you can do, you know, ABC. And that difference um, is dramatic, specifically for students who do not hold the same cultural norms that you might hold. Um, or even if you're in, even if you're not, uh, let's say architecture is largely white, cisgender, heteronormative, right? Um, even if you don't fit that bill, but you're at an institution that perpetuates um, white norms in regards to education, um, then a student that does not fully understand what that means or understand um, might, might mix messages that the university is sending them, that makes a big difference. Um, I'll drop down to attendance. There's one uh, on the unwelcoming side, it says, I expect you to attend every class. If you cannot attend a class, please let me know um, and goes on. On the attendance side, on the welcoming side, it says, you should attend every class, but extenuating circumstances arise that can make this difficult. Um, that's life, right? Like there's a level of graciousness there. Um, so as I stated earlier, I'll move on from this, but as I stated earlier, it's given the student the benefit of the doubt, given, given the student the, um, making the assumption that the student wants to be successful instead of making and writing your syllabus in a way that assumes that the student is trying to get away with as much as he or she or they um, can. The second um, equitable strategy here, as I mentioned earlier, is to allow students to define their own evaluation criteria. So one way would be to have them create a rubric. Um, you can give parameters around that rubric, but really it's um, the effort of validating a student voice is to give them some agency so that they can, um, they can tell you how they'd like to be evaluated, right? The second here happens all the time in architecture. It's presenting a project, presenting a design. Um, it, as a student, took me a long time to understand that my success with outside critics depended on how well I set the stage and told them how I wanted to 
be evaluated. Um, and I think because we do this um, all the time in presentations, we, we set the stage and, and do that. Sometimes we can forget that the student also needs, um, may need guidance around defining their own evaluation criteria um, and, and might need more guidance if they are situated in one or more of the marginalized groups that I presented earlier, right? Um, the most obvious would be um, English language learners, right? So providing space for that is extraordinarily important. A few more characteristics. One is the teacher is a facilitator. So really highlighting that the teacher's role is to guide um, and to, to be a knowledgeable consultant. Um, some examples of this might be just continually requesting feedback, right? From, from students, um, checking for understanding. And then uh, one strategy is just-in-time teaching. Um, it's a bit like the flipped classroom, but just-in-time teaching is where you would give students a, a reading or um, something to review with a very short, um, a short quiz uh, that's due the night before. You would then take that quiz, um, get a, an, a, make an evaluation based on how the class did, and then use your class time um, not to discuss what you have them read in, 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 in its entirety, but really to fill in the gaps or identify where you had students struggling. They call it just-in-time teaching because um, I, th I think its origin is that if you have them read something that's due on Monday, you have them submit um, a, uh, their quiz or answers or questions ahead of time on Monday night, then in the morning you would review, review it and Tuesday you would be able to adjust your teaching to the student, um, to the student's responses. Um, the next characteristic is uh, positive perspectives on parents and families um, of culturally and linguistically diverse students. So um, I've talked about familism in, in other articles that ACSA has, um, but really identifying um, the role of family as it's based in a student's cultural norms. So if you have a class of 50 students, you're likely to have 50 different ideas about ways in which um, family and community members, where boundaries of families are. But it's an important consideration, um, specifically, I'll say, for students from um, low, lower socioeconomic status um, households um, where there's a significant amount of time that is going towards school and a significant um, investment financially that is going towards school. And so allowing space for students to, to remain connected to family if they so choose um, and talk about family dynamics is one way to affirm their, um, their path and their place in the space of your classroom. And so um, my hope is that over this past year, this <laughs> COVID-19 um, year, as you had students in multiple locations, that um, hopefully you all were able to engage family in some way, shape or form, uh, whether that means having um, students use family as a client um, or interviewing a family member for a specific, um, a specific topic. It's also, um, it's also good to have students try to articulate their ideas to someone who um, doesn't have an architecture background uh, one of the three R's, you know, I talked about rigor, relationship, and relevancy is relevancy. And it's important not only that the content of your course 
remain relevant to um, the students, but also that the students can articulate how the content is relevant to their family and or communities. And then if we if you have the opportunity, uh, be it digital or uh, in person, you know, in the fall or, or spring, uh, would be to invite families to reviews or charrettes, right? A few more characteristics. Um, there's a larger list, I'll just um, say ahead of time, there's a larger list of, of uh, tangible strategies here at the end of this presentation. Um, and then we can open it up for, for Q&A. Um, but a few more of the characteristics. One is uh, cultural sensitivity, uh, which is in many ways an another way of saying cultural competence um, and inter interpersonal skills. Um, and this is largely for the faculty member, right? Like, um, and there are two, <laughs> there are many ways that this corresponds, right? So one is this um, <clears throat> myth or idea that if I have, um, if half of my class is black, then I need to teach the black students in a way that is um, black. And I need to, to teach my white students in a way that is white. Um, that's not really what culturally responsive practices and or teaching um, intends. Um, what it does intend is that you're going to send messages to your students in ways that they can understand and are grounded in um, their ways of knowing. Um, that being said, it requires that you have some level of knowledge about um, cultural norms, a diverse set of cultural norms. I'll say that and we can talk about it more in Q&A if, if that wasn't clear for some reason. Um, and then uh, culturally mediated instruction, again, um, is about instruction that is acknowledging and acknowledges cognition um, of multiple cultural backgrounds and identities. Um, one easy way to do this is by promoting text to self connections. Um, and I know that not everyone here is, is in a um, um, literature based um, seminar or literature based lecture. Um, but one way to do that, um, to culturally mediate your instruction is to promote text to self connections. And so as you have students read and respond, whether it's uh, virtually or in person, that they're able to connect the, the text that they've read to themselves in one way, shape or form. Um, and unless something has changed <laughs> students, uh, particularly teenage and young adult students, um, I'd love to draw connections to self. At least that's been my experience. So uh, that shouldn't be very, very difficult to do. Some strategies to do that. Um, this is particularly great in a studio course um, or any other design related course is the strategy to sketch, notice, connect, and wonder. Um, so you'd have an item. You could have an item. Um, this could happen in architectural history as well. But you'd have an item, it could be a picture, it could be a picture of a landscape, it could be, you name it, uh, as, as, as long as it has some visual component, meaning you can set it um, or send it to your students, you would have your students, and you could set this up for a 20 minute uh, time frame or so. Um, you'd have your students sketch the object, which gives them time to metacognate on what they're actually looking at and what they're sketching and the shape of it. Um, then you'd have them spend a few minutes noticing. So um, I have written here, thoughtfully notice and describe the object building um, landscape and site. And so they would write this down. They could just write down single adjectives. They could write down, you know, a longer narrative if they want. Um, but to take notice of as many things as they can within that allotted time. And then draw that connection back to self. Uh, so what does this remind you of in your life? And then what do you wonder or what questions do you have? 
um, it's a great it's a great way to really break down uh, not only break down the design of an item if that's what you use, um, but I find that the connect when I've used this in the classroom that the connect what does this remind you of in your life um, provides multiple opportunities for me as an educator to um, connect and build relationship with students. Um, so I, I encourage you all to, to use that. Again, I'll say it probably a few more times, but I'm all about the three R's. If you can keep them in balance, I think things go pretty well. Um, the next one is to review multiple media of the same event, place, or space, right? Um, so to have and help students understand that there are multiple perspectives for something, um, not only to read them um, or consume them, but to make some evaluation of that. And then come back to the class at large and have some dialogue or, around that. Um, so I think that this one is uh, a pretty straightforward um, strategy. I think there are a few more of um, the characteristics. This one um, is student control classroom discourse, which is really a fancy way of saying, allow your students to dictate and um, be the, the more active uh, engagers in, in discussions. So I have, again, the example of just in time teaching. Um, or allowing for call and response or talk story, uh, which are just um, additional ways to hold dialogue in a classroom among students. Um, and so in this, I'll say, I don't have written here, but this, is a, this would be a, in thinking about this, you should think about the ways in which you expect your students to discuss in class. Is it okay for me to use African-American vernacular English in class when we're doing open discussion? Um, is it okay for me to write in African-American vernacular English on a paper? Um, I always had my students uh, speak it if they wanted to in a course um, and then had a slightly different expectation for them in writing. Um, but this is something to think about, right? Like it, it should be student student uh, focused. And then um, academic discourse and small group instruction, these two are closely related, which is why I put them together. Um, and it says here that instruction is organized around low pressure, student control, learning groups. Um, one example of this is understanding the difference between um, a topic centered way of thinking and writing, which is kind of what I referenced earlier, and topic chaining, with the acknowledgement that in many Black and Indigenous and um, people of color or communities of color, that um, topic chaining is a, a more uh, naturally, it's closer to, to many uh, communities of color's uh, cultural home base, I'll say. So, and the difference is that in topic centered, you have, um, a, I guess we could say a more logical progression of topics where you start, it's like the, the five paragraph uh, paper, right? Where you start and you do an introduction and you state your thesis and then you've got three main points and then you conclude at the end. Topic chaining, I don't know if you've ever read a student's paper, usually a younger student, but a student's paper um, where it feels like the topics, um, when looked at in its entirety, that it's not really um, starting and closing to make a full loop. Topic chaining says, I'm going to start with point one, which is going to take me to point two, which is going to take me to point three, which is going to take me to point four. Um, and so again, something for you to consider in your classroom, what the expectation is, maybe um, stating explicitly when, um, when you're expecting one or the other and a discussion to have with students. Um, 
one strategy that's equitable, which um, feels um, pretty straightforward, but I, I found that few people do, is have students generate community agreements, right? If, if culturally responsive teaching is all about being able to send and receive communication between faculty and students and students and, stu and their peers, other students, um, starting the semester or the year, generating community agreements um, can help set the tone for what the expectations are in the classroom. You as an educator are doing some of this in the classroom by way of your syllabus, right? Which I talked about earlier. Um, but some examples might be listen to understand, be gracious to one another, voice disagreements with respect. Um, and these are things that are not, like it would not matter um, necessarily what your cultural norms are. Um, voicing disagreements with respect transcends some of those things. And there might be some nuances where there would be ways of understanding um, someone's intention or tone or, or all of those um, specific things that happen in the classroom. And I think this is the last one um, here, which is where I want to spend uh, the remainder of, of my time, which is reshaping the curriculum. Um, many schools, uh, you know, in my role at ACSA, I'm, I'm um, typically doing research on um, largely the NAB accredited programs, but in addition to those, the four-year programs and some two-year programs um, that are that are architecture or architecture related. And in the current context of um, a racial reckoning and uh, the global health pandemic, many schools are reshaping the curriculum. I'm gonna talk about some ways in which we can do that that, is, that would qualify as culturally responsive ways. Um, some of them tied directly to anti-racist um, um, work and uh, abolitionist teaching. Um, so I hope you find th this uh, section helpful. Uh, the first one is to compare evidence and experience. And this is um, somewhat like the, uh, the multiple media, like uh, understanding the perspective of multiple media outlets, whether it be TV, poetry, literature. Um, but it's important to talk to students throughout the semester, semester about the difference between a claim that's supported by evidence drawn from research versus experience and an opinion. Um, and I think that's an important detail, and this will come up in some of the later um, suggestions or strategies, it's an important detail to make note of because um, the hope is that students would be able to read a first person narrative account, uh, like a journal entry uh, or, or something like that, historic journal entry, and be able to understand how that is perspective, uh, one person's perspective, and how much weight to give that in, uh, as it compares to larger research that might have happened um, post that first person narrative. I hope that makes sense. Um, but really is, is engaging their critical awareness of evidence and research and opinions. The second is um, challenging the text. So I'll try not to read through all of these questions, but this is a set of questions I came up with. Um, that is largely around reading a text and asking students to um, not just read it for content, but as I just kind of stated, read it for um, tone and motivation. So um, asking them very simply to describe the text, say what's happening, who's talking, um, and who's or who's taking action and what they're doing. Um, also, who's talking um, to ask them to um, 
like I'm scrolling down here, what assumptions, misinformations, or biases might be used to justify injustice in the case of a text? Um, what would justice or fairness look like in this text? Um, it's really about uh, sitting with a text and not reading it um, just for the, the content piece, but evaluating it um, at a more, in the, in the context, I hope I said content, so not reading it for content, but evaluating it in the context of what was happening at that time or what's happening currently, um, how the two might be juxtaposed, et cetera. Um, and I can, I can send this if, if people are interested in it because it has a lot of text on it. The next one um, also has a little bit of text on it. This is one that is for you. This is a strategy for you, right? To evaluate your course um, for that equitable lens. So to consider before you assign something, um, who will be reading the course text, uh, whether it's an excerpt, whether it's a chapter, um, think about who's physically either in your space or digitally um, on the other side of your screen that's gonna be engaged in this text. Um, think about who's narrating the story, like whose voice are you highlighting? Um, to think about, I think the fourth, fourth one down says, does this activity project assignment give privilege to white, middle-class, cisgender, heterosexual, um, able-bodied students who were born in the United States? That one's really specific. You can, you can modify the identity classes as you see fit, um, but really trying to figure out if the assignment that you're given um, is going to give everyone uh, a similar footing um, to understand and engage. So for instance, one of the things that I noted um, as a student was that in architecture is largely about the, the product um, and even about the site before it's about people. Um, if, you, if you flip that in the classroom, um, you'll get a different set of programs that are people-centered and might actually allow for students to tap into the cultural norms that they have and beliefs that they have to come up with drastically different product, products, right? Um, so I can give the example, let's say, and I've said this, I think on the talk before, but let's say um, we were always designing uh, museums and um, sometimes, you know, larger housing, but hotels and, and things like that. Um, just imagine for a second, if you would, how much privilege I might have had if the program were that of a historically black church, right? Um, I grew up in a historically black church and um, I would argue that although in school I was the, um, I was not, you know, part of the, the dominant culture racially, um, that the opposite was happening, right? Like if, if, if you as a professor, a studio professor were to give the, um, the program of a historically black church, it would require a heavier lift for most white students. And I'm, I'm generalizing a little bit, but my guess is that it would require a heavier lift of learning for white students in, in any given class. Um, and so we wanna think about how we're coming up with programs um, and who we're asking or who we're burdening with um, additional learning outside of just the project in and of itself. The next one uh, is to assign resistant reading. Um, so similar to challenging the text, um, this one is facilitating alternative readings of the text that um, challenge dominant cultural beliefs uh, and reject the position the text appears to offer. So you might have something um, that is a review that you ask students to, um, that's already kind of critically reviewed um, that you're asking students to, to read. 
So instead of assigning the main text and asking them to challenge it, here you're assigning a text that has already challenged a main text. Um, I'm going to give the example. Um, so I'm going to, in many ways, combine the two. I'm going to use um, the story of Cinderella. Um, this example was given on teaching tolerance. And so I've just added images to it and um, to try to characterize. Um, this is a popular Disney story um, as, as I have images here. At first reading, I'm sure for, well, I won't even say I'm sure, see, I was gonna, I was gonna do it, we all know, right? Um, but if you've seen the movie, many from my generation understand this to be a beautiful love story um, where the Cinderella becomes a prince and lives happily ever after. So um, without challenging the text or the movie in this case, um, you would note that Cinderella uh, starts the story having lost her um, <clears throat> having lost her father and is in this um, unfortunate situation where she's asked to wait hand and foot on her stepmother and her stepsisters. Um, you'd also note that there's a king in the town, a prince in the town that is looking for a, a wife and Cinderella um, is fortunate enough to have a fairy godmother that helps her have all the things she needs to attend the ball. She goes to the ball, has a great time with the prince, um, loses a glass slipper, and at the end of the story, she lives ha happily ever after, right? If I were going to, to challenge this story um, and be a resistant viewer or, or like I said, challenge the, the film. Um, I could do so through any given identity lens. I'll do so through a lens of sexism um, and say that um, they paint Cinderella, Dis they be in Disney, uh, paint Cinderella uh, in a way that has her largely domesticated um, and uh, has her starting uh, with not only a negative outlook on the world, but also with no access to any privilege or power because she's lost the only man in her life, right? Which is her father. If you juxtapose that to the, the statuesque um, pictures of the palace and the prince, the prince riding this white horse, being so noble, so much power and privilege, um, and then they also make it so that Cinderella's best efforts are even thwarted. And the only way she can, um, it, one, that her only goal is to make it to the ball, right? To, to meet this man and hopefully marry this man. They, um, give her a fairy godmother because the only way she can get to the ball and, and meet her goals is through some sort of magical input, right? Um, here she is dressed in a beautiful gown and um, is sparkling, uh, which is contrasted from her beginning. And when she is, um, when she is sparkling here in, um, in the most, in a, you know, a very intentionally feminine form, then she's like worthy enough to meet the prince. Um, and the prince looks at her and dances with her for 10 minutes and knows she's the one. Like how much, how much conversation, why is Cinderella not giving more value to her, her thought or um, it's, uh, and so then the story ends with her being married to the prince. And once that happens, she is happy. Like, she is, she's validated, right? Um, so much so that, and this is the part that really gets me if you look at this pretty critically, so much so that she has to literally fit the form. Like if she is, if she's, she's not, she has to literally fit the form, which in this case is the shoe, to be worthy 
of the prince or in this case the only real man that they feature in this in this film um so that would be an example you could do the same thing with a text um i just used this because i i felt like it was a pretty um commonly known story and then um i think there are two or three more here and i'll open it up to q a one is um to prioritize local and regional impact and stories. Um, so if, if we were in Oklahoma here, which um, I have the privilege of serving as the golf chair for creative architecture at the University of Oklahoma, um, then we could say we need to look at the history of um, the Sooners and um, the burning of Black Wall Street and um, at the history of the United States and native land in Oklahoma specifically, you would retrofit this to whatever, um, you know, locale that you're coming from. Um, and I think this is the last one. This one came um, from a, a think tank that, that I believe was sponsored by the Society of Architectural Historians, which is to develop the long history of a building site or object, right? Um, to, map spatial use over time or um, uncover a building's origins um, to trace the impact, uh, the environmental impact of an object or a building. Um, the example I like to use is um, here at my alma mater, the Memorial to Enslaved Laborers at the University of Virginia, um, I think is a great example of uh, recognizing the history of a site and developing the long history and then um, trying to champion diversity and equity by um, putting a monument here. So with, oh, I've got one more. Um, this one is one that is used from kindergarten through uh, graduate school, really, it could be. Um, and it's called Spot the Difference. Um, and it's pretty straightforward. Can you spot the difference? Um, like I stated earlier, looking at different, um, you can look at one item through multiple media perspectives, but you can also look at two separate instances um, and spot the difference. What's the difference of response? What's the difference of media coverage? Um, what's the difference of outcome? And then again, can you spot the difference? Um, and I don't mean for this to be gravely political, but um, there's a difference here between these two images and the ways that that the media covered them and the ways um, and the realities of protesting on either side of the fence. Um, so with that, we should open it up to Q&A. Um, and I'll stop screen sharing. I'm hoping that something I said um, was relevant or resonated with, uh, with someone. It looks like if no one has any questions, I mean, I'm, uh, I'd encourage anyone to, to speak up if there are any questions that you might have. Um, okay, I see one coming through. Do you have any experience with asking students to develop their own grading criteria for a studio course or any experience um, with using pretests to gauge understanding or learning from non-traditional architecture students? So this is two questions here. Um, one of them is any experience asking students to develop their own grading criteria for a studio course? Um, I don't, but uh, one of the points that I made that I think, um, and, and it's possible that you all are already doing this, uh, but one of the points that I made was really acknowledging that the importance of setting up, um, setting up the way that a student wants to be evaluated um, orally, like uh, during a review, right? This idea that here's my, here's my project, Here's what I was trying to accomplish. I'd love your feedback on these things, right? Um, and that's a conversation you could have with a, with a student in a studio course is to say, here's, I as the educator, here's what I am 
am hoping to be able to share with you and guide you through, whether it's um, um, integrated design or whether it's um, you know structures or whether it's a housing studio. Here's what I'd like to share. And then um, for the student to say, well, I'm really interested in these things and this is how I'd like to be evaluated. Um, you could always come up with a, a rubric uh, framework, so to speak, to give them. Um, and then the second question was, um, any experience with using pretest to gauge understanding or learning from non-traditional architecture students? I'd be curious if you're saying non-traditional students that are studying architecture or students coming from a non-architectural background. Um, but I would say, um, in architecture, it seems like the way the the status quo, so to speak, is to wipe everyone's slate clean, at least for undergraduates, right? Like you want them to come um, and you want to wipe the slate a little bit, and then you want to build up their architectural knowledge. Um, culturally responsive teaching would say, um, if you are if you are wiping their slate clean, then you've really taken away their ability to be experts. Um, yeah, um, you've taken away their ability to be experts and um, their ability to connect what you're going to share with them to prior experiences. So if you think about it in a really um, straightforward way, um, if I've never been to uh, the beach, it's going to be harder for me to understand what it means to 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 start a uh, to even be participate in a culture in a coastal studio, right? Like because I I don't necessarily have that, and so if you if for the students that do have it, if you strip theirs away, they'd be even more um, um, off kilter, I guess is is what I'll say. Um, feel free to, to push me on that question if someone has something else. That was my question. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, no, no, you did answer it to one degree. Yeah, I totally agree. That's that's sort of an issue I've been working with in my teaching, uh, for sure. Because and what I, bet, I meant by non-traditional students was students that um, that I mean, architecture being kind of the student body being uh much more skewed white much more skewed middle class you know i'm working with students that maybe are not quite in that demographic um and so another area i was sort of thinking about in this question was not even just experiences of like have you ever been to the beach or have you ever like taken a camping trip um it's other things like even down to like have you how often did you play with legos say as a child or art materials or drawing or what were your experiences at museums or you know what i mean and so i'm really looking um, for ways to be responsive to students that maybe haven't had those kinds of experiences and was thinking maybe pre-testing as it being a way of helping them to see how far they're going based on where they started. Yeah, you know what, I, I think one interesting way to, to come up with a pre-test, which is kind of qualitative, I'm sure we thought about if we put our heads together, we could come up with something maybe that's a little, a little bit better, but um, would be to really ask the students at the beginning of the year uh, what their idea, and this I'm thinking beginning design, but you could ask them like what their idea of architecture is. What is architecture? Um, what does that look like? What does it feel like? Um, what is that, you know, what does it mean to navigate through architecture? Um, and I think what you might find is that they will have omitted a lot of things that we um, that are that's part of the built environment, right? Um, and at the end of the course, the hope would be that they understand, um, have a, a greater understanding of some of the um, more vernacular structures, right? Like architecture with a lowercase a, um, mm -hmm. given being given, you know, an equal footing, right? That's a great suggestion. Thank you. Thanks. Let me see. Uh, there's another question here. Shifting how we teach means shifting how we think. Uh, ongoing learning process for everyone, which is true, definitely true. 
What resources are available to support educators doing culturally responsive teaching? Um, so I've always found resources, um, I guess, in a way that's not the most systematic, I apologize. Um, but there are resources that I could potentially share about um, ways to modify your syllabus, right? There are resources um, I've created to some extent, some resources on the ACSA website in the Where My People series. Like you could, you could uh, try to, to take in um, some of the, the analysis of the lived experience of um, people from different uh, ethnic, racial, and cultural backgrounds and how that corresponds to architecture. Um, the only thing that is tricky about kind of having it have a, a, hard, uh, a harder or a hard line tied to race is that uh, you have to be really careful of not um, stereotyping or putting people in boxes based on like, oh, I have a Lat Latinx student. That means that Latinx student is really going to um, champion their family. And so I'm going to do this for this student without them actually dictating that that's where they like to engage or spend their time. Um, but if you shoot me an email, I can send you a few resources. Um, Brown University also has a, a center that has a lot of culturally responsive teaching. Um, and then um, teaching tolerance is meant for educators, again, from K through, through 13 plus, I guess. Um, and teaching tolerance, there are a lot of things, I'll say the majority of it, or at least half of it is meant for K-12 spaces, but um, they're really easy to modify for your own uses. Hello, Nadia. Hey, Kendall. Hi. Hi. How are you? Um, Doing well. Let's see. Thank you so much for all of this. this is fantastic. Um, I, this I'm. I'm not sure my question is quite formulated, but um, uh, so I'll try to get to it. Uh, I, I had some great experiences last semester in an elective class, um, opening up, um, letting students decide kind of how they were going to do the, um, you know, the, the different assignments and that sort of thing. And I really found that the students who were, you know, the African American Latinx students just like dove into it. And, um, you know, the students who were from the, the, the more normative white students um, tended to be, uh, you know, a little bit more nervous about having to define their own parameters. And I, I found that really interesting. And so now I'm trying to think about, okay, and that was an elective that was about you know, social justice and equity. It, it was particular. It had a particular topic related to this, right. and I'm thinking now, like I have an urbanism history class that I'm teaching in the in the fall, and I found that much more difficult to to apply some of the same things to. Um, and uh, you know, I know I need to expand the content to include more examples beyond sort of the canon, um, but also, um, and also, you know, in terms of studio. I, and, and one of the things I'm wondering is, uh, like, I want to make sure that the students who are in the the um, the major, or I can't. I'm sorry, I can't the remember. Dominant. What the dominant mm -hmm. yeah i like i want them to be learning also in respect like i'm learning by seeing how different students are a approaching you know a different approach to assignments but i also want those students to know that and i am wondering how to bring that in so that the students who are in the dominant group aren't just uncomfortable but that they're actually understanding why they're uncomfortable and you know somehow like building that into the yeah i don't know if that that's building it into the discussion or the structure of the course or something like that because i think that that's very important right yeah so um 
I'll try to give two quick thoughts um, based <laughs> off of, of what I heard. Um, one is that um, there's a consideration and there's a, it's a, a bit of a balance, but there's a consideration that um, your students from the dominant group um, who may or may not have traditionally been successful are now, um, have been successful by way of uh, being great students, right? And so part of their identity is based on them being thought of or, or having ways to be successful being a great student. And when you take away the, the or even not take away, but if you remove the normative ways in which we define a great student, then they can feel lost, right? Because the whole point of, or one point of taking your class is to get an A or a B in the class so that they can go to the next thing. And that like, if you, on the opposite, if the race, I'm gonna bring race into it. So if the racial narrative of the black and Latinx student is not that you're a great student, then you're not actually taking anything away from them because even if they're excellent students, because that's it's not necessarily part of uh, their normative experience, right? Like they can be wonderful students, but society's not telling them that you're a great student, you're a great student, do this so you can be a great student. Um, so I think that's Low, probably- It's lower risk. Yeah, right, right. Um, there's, there's probably, a little bit more freedom um, there, there for that. Um, the other piece, oh, is about learning. And I think it is really difficult. So I don't know the age range of your students, but um, students who are 18 to 25 are largely developing their racial identity. And it's so complex. Um, it has myriad ways of, um, of manifesting. I mean, I could, I guess, pull a book off and, and go and read you through the, the steps. But um, that being said, the end goal is for them, uh, for your white students in this particular case, the end goal would be for your white students to realize that what they're learning in regards to social justice or urbanism um, is less about them as an individual, like it's not an interpersonal thing, it's a systematic, large-scale thing, right? So it's decentering themselves and saying like, this is systematic and this is large. Um, and that there is a inherent responsibility for them being from the dominant class to um, uh, in this case, I would say to be anti-racist, but to, to challenge those systems. And so the same could be said, maybe, maybe there's a way that you can frame it. The same could be said for me as a male, right? As a cisgender male, um, if I am going with the status quo, um, even if I'm nice to all the women in my life, if I'm going with the status quo, Quo, then I'm engendering sexism because I'm saying this is like, this is the way it goes, right? You know, I'm, I'm just personally going to be nice. Um, and so maybe it, maybe it means starting the semester or starting the year, framing it through more than just one identity, like framing it through multiple identities. So people are attaching themselves, not just to white and black and brown, but to dominant and marginalized, right? Like, or dominant and, and, and non-dominant. That's just one, one thought. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. I, I think that's a, th those are some really great suggestions. Um, yeah, awesome. Great, well, it looks like maybe we have time for one more question. Um, I'm more than happy to, answer any. I um, will also just put my email here in the chat just in case someone has a question that comes up later that they either didn't feel comfortable asking or um, want to ask at a later date. Uh, Ted Halsey here. 
I'm I'm listening because I'm not a teacher, but um, a pra you know practicing architect, but uh, was listening to some of the comments you made and, and really enjoyed. First of all, what seems to be limit uh, unlimited patience is what it seems that you bring forward, uh, and it's so necessary. Uh, but I guess what I was going to state was an experience that I had at uh, my university, University of Kentucky, and they also had to bring students from University of West Virginia at the time because the University of West Virginia did not have a college of architecture. So we, we got a broad range of people because of it, but it seems like architecture is always about problem solving. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's kind of what we're, you know, the people that are attracted to architecture are thinking of imagining things and trying to express it. And then, uh, a, a couple of years or semesters I can remember that I thought were really quite good and valid was to sort of imagine this thing that you want to create. There aren't any rules. You create a language to express it. And then as you begin to express it, basically your the critique or the evaluation is on how closely did you follow the rules that you established for the thing you're creating and did you achieve you know the vision and mm. the rest of it's really it's about communication because what we do as architects if if we're going to build something is how do you put it on paper and then one of the classes then took it a step further and said okay now we want you to write a description of how you make this thing uh, and usually it was a simplified project so that it could be like folding paper and how do you fold it to create the thing that you're wanting to create. So it really was wide open. You know, there, there weren't any real rules other than the ones that you write. So it, it seemed like it had nothing to do with eth ethnicity. Uh, it didn't matter where you came from. It was, what is it you're wanting to create? Tell us what your language is, what the, the, the language of your uh, rules are going to be. And then let's uh, let's watch you evolve through it. And can you follow the, the rules that you wrote or are you gonna find that you're going to recreate them? And it's sort of like writing and creating music, you know, that that as as the, you know, we're, we're sort of a conduit uh, as humans for whatever that, that thing that we vision and see or hear and how, how do you let it sort of flow through you and you translate it and communicate it to someone and then show them in the end, this really did achieve, or I, I found that I, it, it totally took me to in another direction and I learned all these things along the way. Uh, but we were really quite free about that sort of thing. And then there was a, a welcoming of uh, criticism between students that it was required that um, in the studio, you, you, you were required to uh, crit somebody else's work while they were in progress, which really forced the ego out of it uh, because you're supposed to be understanding what that person was trying to do right. and observe it and help maybe provide an observation. Anyway, those are just thoughts. I'm not a teacher, uh, but I, I found that to be helpful to me. And I think it probably has, it, it's very broad and it'll apply to anyone, I think. Yeah, I think there's definitely a, a large sense of um, of open mindedness required in an exercise like that. Um, and I think it it speaks to I guess I'll close up here, but it, I think it speaks to um, some of my initial points, which were that um, that we the way in which our identities intersect curate our worldview, right? And so, like you said that assignment wasn't really specific to anyone's cultural background or ethnicity um, did by being so open account for everyone's um, varied worldview and having that worldview then allowed people to or, or challenge people to articulate um, articulated in multiple ways. So. Right, and it was always about how can we help you be a better problem solver? You, you you create the problem or write what it is and or what does you want to do but we're we're here to help you uh, to develop the way you approach it how you go through it to support you to be a critical thinker on your own and of course the uh, the diligence and the steadfastness to stick with it
Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you all so much uh, for the time. If anybody has any additional questions, uh, my email is in the chat. Um, so feel free to shoot me an email. I'm um, excited to have you all here and appreciated uh, seeing seeing most some of your faces and, and all of your names. <laughs> uh, so you all take care. Thanks so much. And um, I, I'm just an email away. <laughs>